and welcome once again to Hola America TV on WQPT, your PBS station. Thank you for joining us once again as we explore the sights and sounds of the Hispanic community here in the Midwest. My name is Natalie Zeroni, and I'm a reporter for CBS 4 News here in the Quad Cities and also your host. Today is February 21st, and on today's show, we have a special guest. His name is Tim Tolliver, and he's the new director of the Boys and Girls Club of the Mississippi Valley. He'll talk to us about his experience with the Boys and Girls Clubs and what his vision is for the near future of the club. Also, for all of our audience that are smokers or feel that they're at risk of lung cancer, we're going to tell you how you may qualify for a free low-dose CT scan, thanks to a grant by the Waddell Foundation and the Genesis Health Services Foundation. Also on today's show, we have a special segment on the history of LULAC Council 10, the oldest Latino social justice organization in the area, and what plans they have for the year as they celebrate their 55th anniversary. We'll also bring you the news briefs and the Que Pasa community calendar that will cover some of the current events of our community. As always, we invite you to join the conversation on our Facebook page, Hola America News, or on Twitter. There you'll find more pictures, extended interviews, and more exclusive material. And of course, please visit our remodeled website with a fresh new look, and it's now updated three times a week, so you can keep up with what's happening on our community in Iowa and Illinois. But first, here's a little information about the Boys and Girls Club of the Mississippi Valley. After many years of planning, the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Mississippi Valley has opened a new teen center in downtown Moline. The new teen center, known to teen members as The Club, is located in the Floresiente neighborhood at 1122 Fifth Avenue, Moline, Illinois. The teen center was designed for teens ages 13 through 18 living throughout the Quad Cities. The new teen center of the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Mississippi Valley offers programs to meet both the current and future needs of area teens, including character and leadership programs, including diversity training, leadership clubs, and service learning projects, education and career development programs to help prepare teens for productive and adult years, prevention programs to provide alternatives to a life of crime, drug and alcohol use, and gang activity recreation and physical fitness programs to promote healthy, active lifestyles, arts and technology programs to support teen interest and potential career paths. Young people today face life-threatening challenges on a daily basis, substance abuse, gangs, neglect, hunger, poverty. The list is long and heartbreaking. If young people are to grow up to become productive citizens, they need a safe place where they can just be kids. They need caring adults to guide them toward a rewarding future. Boys and Girls Clubs offer that and more. The Boys and Girls Clubs of the Mississippi Valley is a chartered member of Boys and Girls Clubs of America. For more information on the Boys and Girls Clubs of the Mississippi Valley, call Grace Johnson or Tony Varela at 309-757-5777 or visit www.bgcmb.org. Well, that was a great story. Lots of information about Boys and Girls Club. And to bring it over to our guest, his name is Tim Tolliver, the new executive director of the Boys and Girls Club. Tim, thank you for being with us today. Thank, thank you for having me. Of course. So please tell me, how long have you been with Boys and Girls Club here in the Quad City as, as executive director? Well, I've been, I started in October, so I've been the executive director here for uh, three months. Okay. Uh, but I understand you have a long history with the Boys and Girls Club. Well, I've been uh, uh, in the movement for 32 years. I started out uh, as an eight-year-old uh, at the boys club, as a matter of fact. Uh, girls weren't incorporated until after 1990. Uh, but as an executive uh, or as a staff of the boys and girls clubs, I've been um, uh, it's all of 15 years. Wow. Okay. So well, pretty much a long history of it. So what is the value that the community gets by supporting programs like the Boys and Girls Club? Well, uh, first, I mean, our staff is dedicated to impacting the life of every child that walks through our doors. Um, again, as a club kid, I know first, uh, firsthand the impact that an organization like Boys and Girls Clubs has on a child. Um, we have wonderful award-winning programming uh, handed down from, from our national organization. And, you know, we uh, are determined, again, to, to impact the life of every child. Uh, who, who wants to be a part of our organization. So uh, great program. Again, I know the benefit of it because I was a club kid. Uh, I am a club kid and I will always be a club kid. I, I find that a lot of people who, uh, well, I, I know Antonio Varela, mm -hmm. who's, who's with you guys too, a, a lot of people who, who work with you guys 
started out in the club themselves. As club kids. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, is, yeah it's yeah. really cool and, because and it, yeah. It works for me. You know, again, <laughs> uh, I think the best staff uh, that you can have because, you know, we know uh, what, what, what it takes to, to make a program successful. Uh, as a club kid, you know, again, you're on the other side of it. Uh, it's a little bit different when you become a staff, but you know you know uh, being uh, a kid that has aged out of the program you know what it what it, what a program like that does for you so it's great to have uh, club kids uh, become club staff <laughs> perfect yeah. so tell me you know some of your members recently participated in the lego robotics competition the first one how did they do they uh, came one group came in like fifth or sixth place which again is very very good because this is their first time participating in it and very proud of their effort, very proud of the staff and the volunteers from John Deere that actually assisted uh, those kids in, in, in developing the Legos and, and, and getting that stuff off the ground. So uh, I, I appreciate the, the volunteers again from John Deere for making it happen and again my staff for you know being very supportive of the kids. So that, that sounds like it's a step into the future. What is your vision for the club in the immediate future? Well, we've got several things that need to happen uh, in the very near future, as a matter of fact. And uh, one thing is, uh, it's of course, increasing our visibility. Uh, that's going to be big for us because once we increase our visibility, then we can increase our donor base. Uh, that's going to be huge. We've, we've got to reach out to more people to, to let them know what our mission is and our cause. Uh, we increase our donor base, then we're able to increase our transportation fleet. Um, and, and that's going to be really important, too, because that's going to allow us to increase our membership. Um, we want to reach more kids, and in order to do that, that's, our, our, that's going to be the process for us. That's we, it's, it's fourfold, and, and those are the four. So, very so, important. So, a lot of great things happening. W what's been the biggest challenge for you, uh, you know, as regarding transition into your position and, and taking on this role? Well, uh, kind of eliminating the stigma uh, of what happened prior to my arrival. Um, we've had, and I think more than anything, we've depended on grant funding for so long um, and not a lot of relationship with the community. And so that's been my biggest challenge, you know, getting out there, getting my face out there, getting the mission out there so folks know we actually exist. And, you know, I think that's going to be very, very important for us to sustain ourselves um, uh, in the coming years. And my producer tells me that one of your hobbies is fishing. I love it. Have you had any chance to do that yet in the Not area? Not yet, and I can't too wait to the. Came, oh, right? too cold, and I can't wait to the first thaw. I've got my fishing equipment ready. I mean, my stuff is sitting at the front door, <laughs> waiting on the first thaw. So. Perfect. Well, I I don't know a lot about fishing, but I, I hear you have to polish up your golf skills because. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club Invitational is coming up, yeah. um, so you better bring your A game. Literally, I have to brush up my golf skills. <laughs> uh, I am not a, a avid golfer at all. My lifetime sport is fishing, and so, uh, but I'm going to do what I can to uh, uh, at least make myself just a little bit competitive. So, uh, tell me about the invitation. The Invitational. When is that? It's in uh, uh, July, uh, and it's very huge for us. Um, it raises. Well, last year we raised uh, over $160,000. We're looking to improve upon that this year. Uh, but it is a major fundraiser for our organization. And we're looking forward to it. Group O, who is huge, a uh, huge supporter of our cause here in the Quad Cities, um, they actually put it on for us. The best part about it is that we don't have very much to do uh, with, uh, except show up. You know, and that's the best part about it. And the fact that they've decided to take on this for us uh, is enormous for me. And it was, you know, it was really big when I heard about it. It's a major part of why I wanted to come and, and join the Mississippi Valley team. And so. the, the kids are a part of that too? Uh, the the kids come out, they do a performance uh, in the morning. They're going to do it this year, it's going to be in the morning, uh, not in the evening like it has before. But yeah, the kids are, you know, it, it, it's what it, they're what it's all about and so they have to come out there we have to show them what we're doing uh, how we're impacting our community and uh, I think it's important that the kids show their faces and you know the, the folks know what we're trying to get accomplished well that's a little bit down the road but you know finally just tell me if someone wants to get involved or help you guys out how can they do that well um, it's easy go to our website bgcmv.org um, click on the volunteer tab uh, if you want to be a volunteer or you can click on the donate tab if you want to donate some some money and monetary donations are always welcome uh, it's a big part again of why we're, we're going to be able to sustain ourselves uh, if not for the public's assistance um, you know we, we would be in uh, uh, dire straits and so uh, definitely or you can call our administrative office or stop by one of the clubs so there are different ways to help out monetary but also volunteering your time. also volunteering definitely all right well thank you so much for being with us here today thank you for having me
And next up, we have a segment about an initiative by the Waddell Foundation and the Genesis Health Services Foundation to try to detect lung cancer early on. Sure, the Genesis Health Services Foundation is the recipient of a grant from Genesis Philanthropy, which we will use to, um, for the first, our first project, which will be the Waddell Lung Initiative. With the Waddell Lung Initiative, we'll be offering low-dose CT scans to people that qualify as high risk to have lung cancer. And how do they go about doing this, uh, being you know, qualified to, to be screened for lung cancer? Well, first we want to capture those people that are high risk, that are asymptomatic. You are more likely to survive cancer if we catch cancer in the early stages. So we want to promote early detection of lung cancer with um, minority populations who might not have access to care. Some people don't have a primary care physician. A primary care physician would help you do preventative screenings like a colonoscopy and a mammography. Uh, with a low-dose CT scan to detect lung cancer, we're asking people that are at high risk, that have um, a smoking history or a secondhand smoke history, that have a history of cancer personally or a history of lung cancer in their family, to come and ask their doctor to go over the risks with them, to assess them uh, for lung cancer. And if they don't have a primary care doctor, they may work with community health care to uh, have a doctor write the order so that they can have a free low-dose CT scan at any of our Genesis imaging centers. We've been telling you what a low-dose CT scan is, and now we're going to show you what it is and how simple and effective it is to get screened. A CT scan is uh, basically an x-ray where you lay on a table and pass through a scanner. And it's uh, very quick, it's safe, and uh, very low dose with radiation. It's a great way to take a look at the lungs. It's very easy to get in and out for a lung screen. The purpose of the scan is to really take a good close look at the lungs and see what the lungs look like after smoking. It takes only around uh, 30 seconds to 60 seconds to do a lung screen. A low dose CT scan for screening is best suited for patients uh, between the ages of 55 and uh, 74 who are smokers or who have quit in the last 15 years and have the equivalent of 30 pack year history of smoking. That is, you know, one pack per day for about 30 years. Uh, we can even screen people who are asymptomatic and uh, there's another population if you're over age 50 and uh, have a greater than 20 pack year history and an additional risk factor such as family history or occupational exposure. Uh, besides smoking, uh, the main risk factors would be an occupational exposure to something like uh, asbestosis or uh, silicosis, uh, usually related to the sh you know, shipping industry or the mining industry. An additional risk factor that's probably the most common is, is secondhand smoke. The CT scan simply reveals your lung tissue. And we love to see normal lung tissue, but uh, what we're looking for are abnormal nodules, small, uh, round, abnormal growths in the lung tissue. Uh, here on this uh, scan, uh, we have the middle region of the chest, which we're not really looking at. Your lungs are these uh, dark areas on both sides. And in this particular patient, there is an abnormal uh, mass here in the right lung. This is the right lung and this is the left. Uh, we would like to see this uh, very black with fine lines like this which represent the blood vessels for your lung tissue. But uh, we see something like this and this is certainly abnormal and this patient has a very long history of smoking. When we look at these images uh, we try and divide the findings into four categories either normal and negative or uh, benign changes in the lung, uh, probably benign or suspicious. And in the last two categories, we recommend uh, follow-up with a pulmonologist, so a follow-up scan or an appointment can be scheduled and further evaluation can be made. So if you have any questions about your risk for lung cancer, you can certainly have a discussion with your physician. Of course, the most important thing is to stop smoking and maybe think about a cessation program, but we also have a survey available online and it's listed on the screen at the website below.
LULAC is the largest and oldest civil rights Hispanic organization in the United States. LULAC Council 10 Davenport, Iowa was established in 1959 and this year they celebrate 55 years of existence and they have a lot planned to celebrate this great milestone. In 1959, Henry Vargas conceived the idea of organizing local Mexican Americans of Davenport with the hope of achieving political strength with the United Front. Together, he and other young Mexican Americans formed the LULAC Council 10 in Davenport, Iowa. In the early days, Council 10 met wherever they could, at the YMCA and various taverns. In 1961, the council leased a storefront on Perry Street in downtown Davenport and opened an establishment known as the LULAC Club. Meetings, other council business, and many social events were held there until 1969. It was then that the council made the move to its present location at the west end of Davenport. The last three decades of the 20th century were a time when the members of Council 10 had an immeasurable impact on the Hispanic experience in the Quad City area, but another challenge was looming on the Council's horizon. By 2006, their numbers were dwindling as well. By 2008, membership was down to 46 members. The following year, Michael Reyes was elected president of the Council and things immediately began to change. He began the Council 10 comeback by seeking out and receiving badly needed funding to upgrade the facility. At the same time, Reyes dramatically improved the Council's flagship scholarship program. The amount awarded to deserving college-bound students has increased by 500% since 2007. Every year, LULAC awards thousands of dollars in scholarships to Hispanic and other students of the area. Since 1978, LULAC Council 10 has awarded over $400,000 in scholarships to 673 students. Funds are raised by Council 10 locally through a bingo operation at its activity center and corporate and individual donations. As the momentum of the council improved, so did its membership. By 2013, Council 10 had 165 active members. That number has more than tripled in the last four years. The future of LULAC Council 10 looks as bright as it ever has at this point. My name is Matthew Casillas. I'm the secretary of LULAC Council 10 here in Davenport. And this year, we're going to continue our scholarship program. We plan to award $15,000 to entering freshmen, and that's within a 50-mile radius of the Quad Cities. So anyone that is in that radius can apply for our scholarship, but they can go to school anywhere in the country. Last year, we gave away $15,000. This year, we're going to do 15,000 again but one thing we did last year is we had five area colleges match our funds and we raised an additional four thousand dollars so we're planning on continuing that St. Ambrose matched last year Augustana the Eastern Iowa Community Colleges Western Illinois here in the Quad Cities and Blackhawk Community College all participated in that matching funds program so you can actually go out to our website right now at www.lulac.com 10.org and the scholarship application and instructions are available and online and you can submit that to our uh, local uh, council and that window is open through March 31st of this year. Well th this year we're going to continue uh, the Queen Candidate program and that's to raise funds for our scholarship program. Um, we've been doing that for many many years. We also have bingo every Friday night and so that's a good way that we raise money for our scholarship program. Um, we're also going to have the fifth annual golf tournament, and that will be in August of this year. It's usually at Hidden Hills Country Club, and that's become a very large fundraiser for the local council. And then this year in late October, early November, we'll have our second annual Texas Hold'em poker tournament. And, and we hope to grow that from last year and, and make that uh, a, a larger um, fundraiser for the, the council. And then we, we will also have the Fiesta and we're deciding right now what we're going to do if we're going to hold it at the, the LULAC Hall or because it's our 55th year if we're going to do something a little bit different this year. The dues are um, $22 for the year uh, to become a member. You can actually go to our website at www.lulac10.org and there, there are some uh, applications online or you can stop at the hall. We invite you to join the conversation and follow us on our Facebook page, Hola America News, or on Twitter. Let us know what you think about these interesting subjects. And don't forget to visit our newly remodeled website at 
www.olaamericanews.com. There you'll find more pictures, extended interviews, and more exclusive materials. Now let's check out the news briefs that cover some of the current events in our community from both Iowa and Illinois. It was only 9 degrees on this cold Saturday morning, but it certainly felt a whole lot colder for the more than 30 parents, students, and community leaders that made the trek from Erickson School to Lincoln Irving School, the same route that Erickson School students will have to take next year when the school district closes Erickson School as they have planned. The walk took over 30 minutes, and on a typical school day, the children would have to deal with more traffic, heavy bags, and extreme weather conditions. Organizers and community leaders invite the parents to get more involved and to voice their opinions. Last May, the Moline School Board voted 5-2 to two to close Erickson and Garfield schools and approved a $17.3 million investment in renovation to Hamilton School, a move that is expected to save the district $350,000 per year. In weather like this or when it's below zero, and we walk by areas where there's um, ravines, and, you know, kids walk, they don't walk in a straight line. They're going to end up pushing each other. There was areas where there was no sidewalk accessible. They were walking in the middle of the street. And, I mean, we were able to control them and keep them off to the side for the most part. But when there's not an adult present, kids are going to be in the way of traffic. And there's no traffic right now. Morning traffic during the week, afternoon traffic during the week is very bad in that area. Perfect. Uh, do you have a message to tell the parents? To get involved, to educate yourself, inform yourselves of what possibilities are out there. If that school closes, how is it going to affect your child? How is it going to affect your neighborhood, the community as a whole? How is it going to affect you? Ask questions. Last Saturday morning, the Putnam Museum kicked off their new exhibit, Bittersweet Harvest the Bracero Program 1942 to 1964, with the breakfast hosted by Maria Yaka. Many community leaders from both sides of the river came to check out the opening of this exhibit about the guest worker program, which brought millions of Mexicans as guest workers and ended four decades ago. The exhibit is complemented by many pictures and items from local Mexican immigrants. This traveling exhibit is part of the Bracero Archives from the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History and will be on display at the Putnam Museum until May 18th of this year. Visit our YouTube page to see a video gallery of this exhibit. The Rock Island County Democratic Hispanic Caucus had their quarterly meeting this past Wednesday, February 19th. Around 30 people attended this event where one of the hot topics of the night was the closing of Erickson School and how it will affect the Floresiente neighborhood in Moline. Some of the Democratic candidates were in attendance looking for their support of the attendees in the upcoming primaries. Another point of interest was voting registration and how to increase the number of Hispanics that are registered to vote. Special attention was brought up to the fact that in these primaries in March, 17-year-olds will be eligible to vote as long as they turn 18 by the November elections. The Rock Island County Democratic Hispanic Caucus is an official affiliate of the Rock Island County Democrats. The Hispanic Caucus reaches out to Hispanic voters in Rock Island County and serves as a unified voice to address issues that affect our Hispanic community. Their primary issues of concern include, but are limited to, employment opportunities, social economics, education, cultural diversity, and the support of candidates that advocate for Hispanic needs. We invite you to join the conversation and follow us on our Facebook page, Hola America News, or on Twitter. Let us know what you think about these interesting subjects. And don't forget to visit our newly remodeled website at www.holaamericanews.com. There you'll find more pictures, extended interviews, and more exclusive material. Next up is the Que Pasa calendar, a community calendar where you'll find the latest cultural events for you and your family to enjoy this week. And if your organization would like to feature their events on our Que Pasa calendar, please contact us through Facebook at Hola America News. The 2014 Great River High School Show Choir Invitational will be held at the Adler Theater stage today and tomorrow, February 21st and February 22nd. Great River is hosted by and benefits the show choirs of Davenport Central and West Schools in Davenport, Iowa. 23 show choirs from Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and South Dakota will perform at the 13th annual Great River Show Choir Invitational. The prep show choirs from Central, Blue Vibrations, and West, This Just In, will perform on Friday evening as exhibition groups. 
Sunday, February 23rd, you can name your admission at the Quad City Botanical Center. The choice is yours this Sunday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You decide your admission fees. Pay on the way in or pay on the way out, but please pay us a visit and enjoy all that the Quad City Botanical Center has to offer. Like their giant sandbox, the Quad City Botanical Center has placed two tons of sand in the middle of the indoor sun garden to create a tropical sandbox. The sandbox is open during regular hours. Parents and grandparents are encouraged to bring their children down to play. They may bring their own toys or borrow ours. Take your shoes off and pretend you're in the tropics as you listen to the 14-foot waterfall and feel the sand between your toes. For more events, please visit our remodeled website, www.olamericanews.com, and please sign up for our weekly e-newsletter for updates on what is going on every week in the Hispanic communities of Illinois and Iowa. It's time to say goodbye for tonight, but we would love to hear from you. So don't forget to connect with us through our Facebook page, Hola America News, or at Twitter at HATV with Natalie. And we are now on Instagram, where you will see exclusive pictures from our guests and some behind the scenes pictures. And if you missed any of our previous shows, you can catch them on our YouTube channel, Hola America TV. And don't forget to tune in next week when we'll continue our journey of the sights and sounds of the Hispanic community here in the Midwest. Muchas gracias y buenas noches.